everyone. Live at five, coming to you from Cranbrook House. Uh, the result of our survey come from Cranbrook House and not Brookside. Um, I am your curator, Kevin Adkison, uh, with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. It's been a wild day here at Cranbrook. We only just got power back a few minutes ago. Um, and so I wasn't able to connect to any of our resources to do research. So I wanted to talk about a piece that I know, I think most of the things I need to know about it already, which is this funny, wonderful, maybe terrible trump loy painting painting of two Georges. Um, I am here at Cranbrook House. Um, if you join my other Live at Five tours or you know Cranbrook well, uh, of course, this is the home of our founders, George and Ellen Scripps Booth. And they moved here to the middle section in 1908. And then in 1919, they added on the West Wing. Um, and in 1918, they added on the library wing. And I'll step down just to show you where we are. Um, so you have the still room is this little pavilion that sort of pops out from the west wing. And we're going to head in there in a moment. Um, the library or the, the mountain is here planted with pine trees to help stop erosion. And then in the center, this used to be a gravel court, um, and there is this French horse trough that is used as a fountain in the center, and then the main entrance to the house. Now, there are a couple of things around the painting, and the focus is going to be on the painting today, get us in the mood for July 4th. Um, there's this beautiful urn that perhaps is from the collection of antiquities that were brought back from Geza Moroti in 1927. Uh, also down below is the Booth carriage step from the house in Detroit uh, that was moved up here to Cranbrook, um, never used as a carriage step here on the side of the house. But this is a much more modern piece than all the rest. Um, this is from 1976, and so it was dedicated about 44 years ago um, in July of 1976. It is Cranbrook's contribution to the subgenre of American art on bicentennial-related art. This was commissioned by Henry Scripps Booth whose uh, house, Thornley, we went to on our Facebook Live at 5 last week. And Henry Scripps Booth was uh, an architect by training. He studied with Aliel Saarinen at Michigan. Um, he lived at Thornley from 1925 until his death in 1988. Um, and he was involved with all aspects of Cranbrook's history, uh, uh, leadership. And so um, Henry Scripps Booth served on the Cranbrook Foundation from, for its entire existence from 1927 to 73. And then he also served in leadership of Cranbrook Educational Community after we were reestablished in 73. And he was very interested in maintaining both his family's history, but also unique traditions um, and creating different uh, expressions of art that would tie back to his own family's legacy establishing Cranbrook but also bring um, new mystery to the campus. And so he commissions this for a blind window here on Albert Kahn's um, designed house. And he commissions an artist who I can't really find much information about, Gregory High, who earned his Masters of Fine Arts in painting from Cranbrook in 1977. And the subject matter is a sort of tale of two Georges. So down below is George Booth, Cranbrook's founder, who is taking a nap on his um, daybed, which we'll step inside and see in a moment. So you're sort of seeing into the room behind. George Booth then has a fly on his nose, um, and George Washington is holding a fly swatter. 
and he is about to swat the fly off of George Booth. Now, Washington is holding a copy of the Philadelphia Gazette of July 4th, 1776. And Henry explained um, that the window uh, commemorates the long list of founders who seized opportunities that have been bequeathed to them from those who have gone before. And Henry explained the fly as meaning... There is at least one fly in almost every organizational ointment, as well as in many of our best dreams. Those pesky flies require a decisive swat by a person of intuition and experience of historical perspective. George Washington, in a haze of tradition, plays that part in this bit of symbolic fantasy. It is painted in acrylics um, on board and then mounted in the window and covered with a plexiglass frame. It is a little bit mysterious. It's not the greatest painting I've ever seen, um, uh, but it is this sort of interesting late addition to the house. Um, Henry Booth uh, thought that this would inspire people to sort of notice and to contemplate the history where we stand in our history and to think about uh, the future and the past at this moment of the bicentennial. Now, it was dedicated on in July 4th, seven, uh, 1976, and it was dedicated by George and Ellen's three-year-old great-great-granddaughter, Stephanie Booth, who was in her great-great-grandmother's 1867 um, christening dress for the dedication. Now, Technically, the window does, sh uh, it is a trompe l'oeil for the room behind it. So we'll head inside past this uh, incredible Samuel Yellen produced door knocker, which has this little, almost looks like a bulldog in the front and then the, the sort of night behind, tying into that arts and crafts aesthetic that all of Cranbrook House is, and uh, relating back to the sort of English heritage of Cranbrook. And Samuel Yellen also fabricated all of these um, nails that are in the door, these decorative nail heads. And then Samuel Yellen also fabricated the doorknob and door plate, which has a thistle here, which was Henry Booth's nickname. Uh, thistle. And so you could head into this store and you would originally have gone into George Booth's suite of offices, so you wouldn't have to go through the front door at all. After his father passed away, Henry Booth took these offices over and he used them as his own offices until the 1980s. And on the other side, we see more of Samuel Yellen's ironwork. Um, and he actually signed the back of the handle, which is not going to be picked up. So this would have been George Booth's office later, Henry Booth's office. Um, later than that, it was used by Cranbrook Archives before it moved over to Thornley Studio. And so George could sit at his desk in there. Then he had the drafting room suite uh, here where he could work on architectural plans and study the uh, Cranbrook plot plan of 1904, but the trompe l'oeil painting uh, is on the opposite side of this wall. Uh, and so this is the piece of furniture that we saw George Booth painted resting his head on. Uh, and I think that the artist, George High, Gregory High, did a pretty good job of capturing the daybed. Now, George Booth called this room the still room, which in an English house would have been where liquor was distilled. Uh, but the Episcopalian teetotaling booths used this room instead as a place to be still. And I've talked about this room on some other tours, but in case you're just joining us here, uh, the ceiling is by Ulysses Ricci, who was a New York sculptor. Uh, this ceiling was sculpted in four parts and shipped to Michigan by train. It was a white ceiling until 1919 when the Booth's eldest son, James, who was an artist and engineer, rigged up a um, uh, seat, a sort of folding chair, and then he painted the ceiling in this Pompeian scheme. 
Now, if you don't know the name Ulysses Ritchie, Ritchie and you are a Detroiter, you absolutely know his work. Um, he did all the carvings on the General Motors building by Albert Kahn. Uh, he did the carvings on Angel Hall at Michigan and the Hatcher Graduate Library. And he was also the mentor of um, Parducci. And so Parducci came out of Ricci's studio. But we're going to focus on what George Booth was painted on, this day bed, which is to the designs of Francis Bacon. And you may know the Boston Bacons, a very prominent uh, New England family. Um, Francis's brother, Henry Bacon, was, of course, the architect of the Lincoln Memorial. But Francis, had, who had also studied architecture at MIT, um, he went from MIT to work for McKim, Mead, and White, the prominent classical architects. Uh, he then went on to work for Herder Brothers, and he went from McKim, Mead, and White to Herder Brothers because there was such an increase in pay, and he realized that he would never make any money as an architect, and so he decided to be an interior designer. He worked on William Vanderbilt's house on Fifth Avenue. Uh, in the 1880s, he worked in the far eastern or western end of Turkey at Assos, and he worked for two years as an um, archaeologist documenting classical designs, which helped inform Bacon's later career uh, when he perfected a style of furniture known as the colonial renaissance. And I think this is a pretty good exa example of what could be termed early colonial revival or early renaissance revival. Um, but for Bacon, it was a sort of distinct furniture type, uh, which was looking towards classical design and classical furniture, and then sort of inventing it for the American market. Later on, Francis Bacon had a career with the Davenport Furniture Company, which produced much of the furniture uh, at Cranbrook School for Boys in the library. That is also Francis Bacon Designs. And there's an interesting relationship between the Bacon family and Albert Kahn, because when Henry Britt Bacon of the Lincoln Memorial was traveling through Europe a little bit later, he was the younger brother, uh, he ran into a young Albert Kahn who was on a scholarship traveling through Europe, and they struck up a lifelong friendship. And Albert Kahn, of course, the architect of the house. Um, the upholstery is original back to 1918. It may have been updated. Um, things that I could look up if our entire computer system wasn't down. Um, this room is surprisingly poorly documented in Cranbrook archives. There are virtually no historic photos of the interior of this room. The rug is original, the ceiling's original, this daybed is original, and the Paul Manship candelabras depicting Adam and Eve are original. Paul Manship, who sculpted Prometheus at Rockefeller Center. So many of these items are original. The painting um, is not. That is from the estate of Grace Booth Wallace, the daughter. But I think that the upholstery is in a pretty correct vintage. So this is where George Booth, who was kind of short, would take naps during the day where he would relax and be still in his still room and where after his own death in 1949, um, several decades later in 1976, Henry Booth depicted George Booth here at the window. So I hope you enjoyed this closer look at a work of art that I'm not sure has held up, um, but it is interesting to see here this work by Gregory High, an Academy alumni. If anyone knows in, any information on Mr. High, I would love to learn a little bit more about what happened to him and his career. Of course, there are many Academy alumni who do not go on to artist career, um, so my own Googling was unable to find any information on him. Um, but I think it's this painting is part of the wider Cranbrook story uh, and, and shows all of the sort of diversity of changes and additions that have been made to the house over the years. I hope you're all being safe. I hope that you have power. I hope I don't get food poisoning from my refrigerator being off all day. 
Um, I look forward to seeing you on Thursday for another Live at Five, um, every Tuesday and Thursday here on Instagram at five o'clock. And tomorrow on Facebook, I'll be coming to you uh, with a live tour of something. Um, who knows what? If you have suggestions, please leave it, them in the comments. On Thursday, I'll be coming to you from the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House, and we're going to be doing a tour of the ceramics of Smith House. So be safe, wear your mask, um, and I'll see you soon. And happy early 4th of July from two great Americans, the multiple Georges.